Thank you, Srikant. Uh, and thank you, Nipun, uh, the co-chairs of the Bhad Summit this year to, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, it's fascinating to see that this conversation track has begun, though, like Srikant rightly said, uh, there are more people representing the 250 million outside than the ones representing the billion in this room. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting journey as this summit evolves over time. Uh, hopefully, we will have more people who represent the billion in India rather than the 250 million in India. So um, what I thought I'll do today, of course, you'll have uh, a day full of presentations and videos and stuff. So I am not going to give you one more round of slides, but rather share some thoughts on what have been some um, big questions that we have been working with as we think about uh, what does it mean to develop large-scale services for a nation like India. Um, it's important to understand that India is a country of a billion aspirations, and hence uh, it behooves us to be the ones who actually work towards delivering on those aspirations in the years to come. This is just the beginning. It's large, it's diverse, and it's developing. And I'm sure that you have looked at the enormity. Whenever I am at international forums talking to different people, talking to them about India and the size, people's jaws just drop, right? Because this is the largest moving entity that people have encountered, uh, which exists as one integrated country, right? And so that's, that's a very big, very big responsibility on us. It's a country of more than 1.2 billion people. But interestingly, it's a country where more, less than 5% people actually pay income taxes. So it's a, it's a very interesting dichotomy that you deal with. And 400 million people in this country are people who actually work in places which are not necessarily their hometowns. So it's, it's a country of people moving around very dramatically across the entire diaspora, which opens up many questions for the kind of products and services that they could or do look for which is very different from uh, many geocentric um, uh, economies where people essentially are concentrated around geographical clusters, there's certain stability, there's a certain construct. But we are dealing with uh, an environment where it's not geocentric. Uh, it's neither geocentric nor it's ethnocentric. It's actually a polycentric economy. And so how do you develop products and services for a country where in a city, in a unit, you could find people from any part of the country coming together uh, because of different reasons, uh, economic or otherwise. So it's an interesting question. It's a large question that we have to deal with. And if we are thinking about innovating for a few, then it's very hard to do this uh, in this context um, because the scale economics of this environment is very different. It's diverse, uh, broadly three broad constructs, if you will, uh, what we in conversations call India 1, India 2, India 3, or Bharat 1, Bharat 2, Bharat 3, whichever way you want to slice it. 36% of people who have incomes more than $7.4,000 um, as a construct. Uh, that's about 103 million households in this country. Um, India 2, which is about 36% again, uh, somewhere about $3,300. Uh, as their income levels uh, under the 103 uh, million households. And then there's, of course, 28% of the country, which is less than 3,300. That's about 80 million households. So it's not, it's not, uh, um, it's not uniform. Uh, uh, and we always say that it's a country that's unified but not uniform. And so how do you deal with this kind of a diversity? And I just took one axis of diversity. If you took other different axes of diversity across cultures, language, social economic background, demographics, politics, it's an extremely diverse environment, right? So it's very difficult to design something and stamp it all over the country because that doesn't make sense at all. So, so that's an important question to deal with, saying what, how do you innovate for extremely diverse environments where the concept of segmentation and market design itself gets significantly challenged. In classical you know, startup world, we talk about how do you really understand and, and create segmented markets. And when you have a million segments, in a country of a billion people, that's an important design question as to how do you really design for that. It's developing. Morgan Stanley came out with this whole projection of that by 2027, uh, we will be a $6 trillion GDP, right? 
we will be about $6.1 trillion in equity market cap, and we will be about $1.8 trillion in the financial sector and about $2 trillion in the consumer sector. So, and do you think this will come from the 250 million uh, consumers? No, it will come from the billion plus consumers. But where are the products and services that could create this kind of a GDP is a question, right, as to how will this happen. So it's developing. The other interesting indicators of development, which is rising consumption. Uh, by 2021, it is expected that India would be growing at about 6.7% year on year in domestic consumption, which is a massive thing. Uh, so it's, it's a market in its own, right? While we might have globalization conversations going on, it's a market in its own, uh, which, is, which is massive and growing at a breakneck speed and has been increasingly growing faster and faster over the last few years. Uh, there's a very rapid increase in disposable income over the last 10 years. Um, and what does that mean? And that disposable income is not necessarily coming through a concentration of a few, but it's in general, it's more secular in terms of its pattern as to how disposable income is increasing. Most importantly, it's young, right? 50% uh, of Indians are less than 25 years of age. Uh, the median age is 27.3 can see it right, this right here as well. So it's, it's a young country and the products and services that are required by a very, very young diaspora is very different from what you would otherwise think of in terms of matured markets. Uh, there are new aspirations and highly hyper-connected uh, are getting increasingly hyper-connected. I travel a lot to rural India. I spend a lot of time uh, in questions around education, healthcare, water, sanitation, urban development in different parts. And I can see that it is a very, very rapidly hyper-connecting environment. And so question is, what does this hyper-connection mean for the kind of products and innovations that we would see in the times to come? It's rapidly urbanizing. If you looked at the statistics of uh, cities which have more than a million people's population in an eight-mile radius ballpark, Today we have about 46 cities, uh, and if you look at half a million population and above, we have 89 cities which have that characteristic, and it's rapidly increasing. Uh, today, if you go by the classical definition of an urban local body, this is a country of about 4,400 ballpark urban local bodies, forecasted to be 6,000 plus in the next couple of years, right? So that's another interesting twist to the problem that it's, it's, a, it's a rapidly urbanizing country. Um, and urbanizing does not mean that uh, you have cities of which we see pictures and, and we have that image, but these cities are very different. The kind of services that these cities offer are very different or don't offer are also very different, right? Uh, so it's a question saying, what, what do we need to do? It's a very rapidly expanding middle class. Um, by 2030, the Indian middle class will be the highest in population in the world, even bigger than China's middle class. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, what kind of products, what kind of services uh, in that income bracket and how do we deal with that? So it's, it's a very interesting time in time where we are currently placed, where this is happening right around us. Um, and um, interestingly also happening in areas where we don't visit very often and we don't see because you know, all of us uh, more or less spend most of our time in urban India. And, but this new and uprising and coming India is something that we don't see very often. So it's an interesting question. There is enough evidence to show that what really Bharat needs is a radical revolution in financial services because of the, the way this entire economy is evolving. It's not the classical construct of financial services that the world has seen in the past because this is a very different kind of an economy. So it needs uh, very extreme innovative thinking in the way financial services around lending, credit, savings, all the entire slew of financial services uh, it needs a very different response to housing uh, because at this rate of change, at this rate of urbanization, at this rate of evolution, uh, it's going to be interesting how the entire housing industry evolves. It needs a very different perspective on healthcare uh, because as you see the middle class growing and, and, and lifestyles changing, as well as people becoming more and more aware and demanding of better and better healthcare solutions, it needs a very different response to healthcare than one we have ever seen in the past. It needs a very different response to education. Uh, and, uh, and that's again a very, very big question saying, you know, it's a country of 350 million plus children with 200 million children in the early stages of education. What does this mean? And if we don't uh, address or, or respond with production services for this sector, this will last us for another 75 years because education is something that creates shockwaves for many decades to come. So if we don't look at it in our lifetime, 
75 years will be the ripple effect of what we do today uh, over the years to come. It needs a very different response to retail and consumer goods. And we can see it happening uh, in some ways. And some of you who are penetrating deeper into uh, the non-central cities as well as deeper into the rural will realize how, um, how rapidly is the entire conversation around retail and consumer goods is completely exploding in front of our eyes. Most importantly, because of the bulging middle class, we really need to think about tourism, leisure, because that's a very important element that's opening up because now you have a rising aspiration of a middle class who has never potentially taken a structured holiday in their life and now they would get that uh, ambition to do it. And so what does hospitality mean? What does lifestyle mean? What does leisure mean? All these kind of services. So we are at a very interesting point in time uh, and an opportunity for that matter that all these services, which are service heavy industries and not necessarily that much product heavy industries, um, are going to see an interesting evolution uh, and it's for us to think about what could be the kind of constructs and designs and what could you, all of you as entrepreneurs and, and startup um, leaders do to be able to really turn that opportunity into something that is sustainable and, and very, very exciting for the future of India. Kind of boils down into three important questions. When you think of your game plan, your future, how do you think of scale? What's your definition of scale? I meet a lot of startups all the time, both in the for-profit and not-for-profit sector. And most of the time people will say that, you know, I was doing 100,000 units of something and now I'm going to do 200,000 units of something and I'm scaling. And I would always say that you are growing, you're not scaling. If you really want to do a conversation on scaling, let's work backwards from what is the scale of India. And scale has to be seen in that context, right? Doing a million to two million in India is growing. Understanding how to service 200 million is scaling. So it's a very different scale. It's a very different ruler with which one has to think because if you're working for the 250 million, the scale is, the ruler is very different. If you're working for a billion, the ruler is very different. And if you don't get the ruler right, economics will hurt you because you know the scale economics of a billion are very different from the scale economics of 100 million. And if you approach the, the billion dollar challenge with a hundred million scale mindset and that economics, obviously it's unviable, it's not sustainable. And so that's an, that's an important question to debate as to when you're looking at the billion, what is your frame of scale? What's your frame of diversity? Because we deal with a complex economy and one of the hallmarks of a complex system is that's highly unpredictable. Right, like we always say that making a rocket is complicated, raising a child is complex. And the question is, you just don't know what the outcomes would be like and where could this do and what kind of turns. And plus it's subject to all the externalities that one could really deal with, especially as you go deeper and deeper into India, it has got way more externalities than you see in control environments which are more urban in nature, right? We fret with the externalities that we see in the radius of 50 kilometers around us, but imagine when you go deeper into the different parts of the country, then uncertainty and unpredictability is the hallmark. That's the way life is. And so how do you design production services that can deal with unpredictable situations? How do you embrace that diversity? And third, of course, is it's an extremely dynamic env environment, right? For example, if the kind of middle class explosions that I shared with you, if that plays out, you don't even know at what speed these things will turn because one change would completely change the theory itself. Right? I remember Peter Senge uh, once uh, remarked saying, in the dance of change, the first change that you make recalibrates the entire rest of the change journey that you have thought about. So you may have some grand plan in your head, but when the first change in the economy happens, all of that grand plan is going to go away. So how do you create rapidly evolving business models? How do you create rapid, and by the time you get through a couple of years, you may be in your eighth or ninth or 10th period, rather than saying, oh my God, I had this idea and that idea is not working because that idea may not even have ground to uh, quarters down the line. So it's a very rapidly, so that's an important question. So the large questions that, that I think about, um, for example, if we were in the financial services sector thinking about lending, the large question that, that is interesting to explore is how do you create a business model that could extend affordable credit to 100 million households who have never borrowed formal money ever in their life. How do we deal with that question? 
Um, and that's a very, very interesting and a very complex question because um, most of us in this room can borrow money at pretty decent rates, probably half to maybe one third of the rates at which the rest of India borrows money. And so the question is, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with a business model that can be viable to lend at uh, a billion people scale at sub 10% interest rates, whereas the general market economy lends at 26 to 32%. What does that mean? Or how do you construct such a model? And is that model possible? We know that it's possible. The question is, how do we actually make that happen? So it's, it's a very, very important kind of, so those are the kind of questions we need to worry about. Or when we talk about health, how do you extend um, very uh, reliable as well as very high quality healthcare to 100 million families in the remotest part of the countries uh, in a very uh, affordable and reliable fashion. What does that take? Uh, obviously, that answer has not yet been found. Um, and that question is still open for us to innovate. In the end, innovators always look for questions to which the society has not found answers. Uh, rather than replicate somebody else's answer and saying, I can do it better than that, right? Saying, so uh, I'm sure none of you are obsessed with how to create the next cat video, uh, but you're obsessed with how do you solve some of the most difficult and the most complex questions that the country faces. Uh -huh. And so if you go into, say, for example, urbanization, we talked about it briefly. The question is, at this speed of urbanization, how do you even create reliable urban services? Um, where you will have hundreds of these towns coming up over time and how do you deal with um, even something as basic as the fundamental citizen services at scale and what are the innovation possible? Those are the real complex questions, right? The, the real complex questions uh, or for example, water, um, you know, uh, we don't talk about that much because our notion of water is what comes out of the tap. Uh, but uh, Bharat has a different understanding of what does water mean and what does it mean to create water security for 100 million uh, distressed families uh, across the country and what kind of innovations, what kind of business models are possible to improve the water security of the country and what can we do? And so those are the larger, more difficult, more out of the ordinary questions. Uh, education, my colleague Madhu is here and later on he'll be on the panel talking to you about the work uh, that he's driving in the area of education. How do you ensure reliable literacy and numeracy of 200 million children in this country? Um, and, and like I said, if you miss that, then we will bear the consequences for 75 years to come. So how do you, how do you deal with that question? Or if you look at artisans and farmers, uh, and we know that uh, bulk of the uh, organization, uh, bulk of the Indian um, diaspora is a lot of agriculture and artisans. How do you deal with that? How do you create stability in income? How do you ensure value appropriation in the right ways? such that uh, the, the farmers and the artisans of this country are not paid for their labor, but they are actually paid for the value that they create for the economy. And so it's, these are the kind of very, very difficult uh, questions, especially when you, when you impose the question of scale on it. Can you do it for 50,000 farmers is a different question. Can you do it for 100 million farmers? It's a very different question, right? Because classically, the model that we have all grown up on uh, including myself, is the model saying, make something work and scale what works, right? So you go through this phase of piloting something and trying something and designing something and making it work for A segment, B segment, and then say, I've cracked it, and now how do I scale? But unfortunately, at scale, the equation, the question is a little different. It's just a wordplay. Instead of scaling what works, the real question is what works at scale? And it's not necessary that what works necessarily works at scale. Uh, and so starting with scale thinking in the beginning as to will this work when I have to service uh, at that scale is an important design question uh, that we all have to deal with rather than saying I can scale this in a controlled environment and then once I figured this out, I'm going to make it scale. And that's an important question. For example, if you go back in the history of mankind, if you look at revolutions which were, for example, the telegraphy or the GPS or the internet, they were not thought about as constructs where people said, let me try this in one small corner and then figure out how it scales. The very starting design vision is one that this is going to be a highly scalable going in position rather than as an afterthought. So scale as a design question is an important question that we all have to deal with. At scale, there are three important imperatives or what I would say is design imperatives. One is the imperative of agency, because to create large scale successful production services, they have to be rooted in how do you restore the agency of the ecosystem that you're working with, rather than 
create products that can essentially create very, very controlled environments and very guided environments. So much more open, much more collaborative, and much more agency environments. Uh, for example, if you are going to create a lending product for 100 million people across this country, what is the agency at the last mile of the farmer and the one who is lending the money to be able to make decisions then and there in that design is an important question. Uh, because if you have lending products that are figured out in a corporate office and deployed across the country, distributed if you mean, they might not work because nobody sitting in one place would be able to anticipate what are the challenges that happen on the ground. Second question is of dignity because you know this whole thinking around saying you need to have different kinds of lower capability products for the larger billion question is probably unfounded because uh, that's an entire population that also has a very strong sense of dignity and what they want. And the third important question is of choice. Uh, as to how do you create a market and how do you create an environment where people have choice uh, and have the ability to decide between different price points and different constructs. So how do you create a design construct which is built on the foundation of agency, dignity, and choice when you innovate for this billion rather than saying, oh, we have to have something which is of this nature because you know these people don't have paying power. I think that, that construct is no more valid. That completely has to be taken off the mind. So it needs a new family of products and services, um, a broad migration from low volume, high value, high cost design construct to a very high volume, low value, low cost construct, right? And that's an important question uh, as to how to deal with that because the, the entire chain that you will go through in the seminar today will be very different from that, right? From design to its, uh, production to its operations to its engine whatever part you do it's very 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 different it's not just a logical extension of I can do this for two million people so I can do this for a hundred million people that doesn't hold true and I think that those are the kind of questions that we really have to worry about and so I have uh, five design principles if you will uh, for you to consider uh, when you're thinking about this first important thing is that Classical product design and classical thinking is driven by what is called as convergent thinking, right? Which is you try to bring it down to a core thing that works for a core segment under a core design, whereas what works at scale is divergent thinking. So how do you embrace diversity in your design? How do you design it for very, very diverse environments? Which essentially means that your designs become more and more minimalistic because you cannot anticipate all the diversity of India in your design. So how do you design minimalistic capabilities that can over time then take many color shapes and sizes rather than design comprehensive monoliths that can work extremely well in A situation with the hope that we will be able to replicate it to B, C, and D, but that replication will never happen, right? So how do you think about that as a design principle saying I have to design for divergence rather than design for convergence, saying everybody will do the things I, the way I think they will happen, vis-a-vis -vis, I have no clue how people will do things. So let me design things that they will figure out how to do, and so my design has to be minimalistic, basic, uh, construct. The second one is, of course, um, how do you design for a network and not for a segment? Because a classical design construct is saying, how do I slice and dice my market and decide the segment I want to focus on and design for a segment? Um, which has certain characteristics and you know the whole discipline of doing personas and uh, understanding what kind of people are we dealing with, what kind of product services are required, to an environment where actually I'm designing for a network, uh, designing for an ecosystem whose players I will discover as time goes by. Um, and so how do I, and there could be network effects between the players which I can't anticipate and hence how do I ensure that my design is a foundation to build networks rather than concentrate and focus on on a defined segment which has a boundary condition which has been defined by me. So this boundary driven design construct, moving it into a network driven design construct, I don't know. So because you know classically people have a pipe design mindset, right? You put in inputs, processes happen, comes an output, vis-a-vis -vis a network design which is, which is not like a pipe. So it's a very, very important question saying am I designing for a segment or am I designing for a network of actors? And that brings me to the third design principle saying um, more than being entrepreneurs, uh, it will be very important for us to be system builders or system shapers or system leaders. Which means that our products and services would have to intersect with Samaj, Bazaar and Sarkar. So we'll have to have an intersection between civil society, the private sector and the government. 
because to serve the billion in this country, we can't do it by lining up or working only with one segment of this entire ecosystem. There are a lot of services and products that are rendered by other parts of the society, and so how do you understand those, integrate with those, and amplify the efforts that are being made by different parts of this environment because no one alone can deal with this kind of a market and there's enough for everybody else to do. And so the question is, what role do we play <clears throat> in catalyzing the system rather than getting into this mindset of saying, I'm a competitive environment, I'm a competitive business, this is what I can do, this is my boundary condition. So breaking that boundary of design is a very difficult challenge, right? Uh, uh, if you have to service a billion people with affordable credit, uh, that's a very different construct than trying to uh, service a certain segment which is only amenable to my, my game plan. So the question is, are we system leaders or are we, um, you know, sort of people who are pushing our own boundary product design is a question that we have to deal with. And the fifth and the last one is very importantly the role of data because when a billion people get serviced, uh, like we say, India generates uh, data much faster than any other part of the world because of the extent of digitization as well as the size of the, of the population. So if you multiply these two, this is a very explosive data environment. But classically in entrepreneurship, data has been seen as a control point. Uh, if you have data, you're the king. If you have data, you have the ability to control the competitive intensity of the industry. But if you have to service Bharat, then we have to use data as an empowerment tool rather than as a control tool, which means how do we and brings me back to the initial point of agency as to how do you bring the control back to the ecosystem that can consume your services. Because the ecosystem of a billion people will not be able to consume your services if they don't feel more empowered, more agency, and more capable. And so just by expecting that, you know, because we have a nice product that they will be able to do something is a, is a very difficult conversation to hold. So the question is what role does data play in your game plan? Do you empower the ecosystem with data or do you try to control the ecosystem with data? And the classical construct of business has always been designed with the mindset of saying control with data. Um, and uh, the question is, can we challenge that paradigm? So I, I believe that these are some important questions. How do you design for divergence? How do you design for a network? How do you essentially go and uh, demonstrate system leadership? How do you go ahead and, and uh, invert the way data has been seen. And, and, and so th those kind of questions are the ones that probably would, would be interesting to deliberate uh, over the times to come. And uh, in the end, what would make this kind of a thing happen? These are, of course, very hard problems and hence need the best of the minds, such as the ones in this room. And so the big question is, uh, uh, I call it the chip principle. Each of our initiatives need an energy chip. What is a chip? Of course, it needs capital. And you'll be surprised in the ways in, in which capital shows up when you're looking at problems like this. Srikant uh, alluded to some of those, that there, that there are different kinds of capital rather than the classical capital that the entrepreneur system sees, uh, ship sees. Because when you bring together Samaj, Bazaar, Sarkar, that brings a very different capital ecosystem to play. Uh, whereas if you only look at Bazaar, then that has a very different capital ecosystem that you play with. So you have a much wider capital ecosystem so it's about capital, it's about hormones, right? Because this future will be driven by the young of India. It's about ideas and it's about passion. So um, that's what I thought I would share with you. I would like to wish you all the very best as you go on this journey of rapid evolution. And hopefully uh, you would be the architects and creators of the India that we all aspire to see. All the very best, have a great conference. Thank you so much. Yeah.